This morning as we come to really begin looking into this all-important subject, I love preaching on, on subjects, topics like this, because you know, every once in a while you preach those messages that are just kind of geared specifically uh, for, for one particular, you know, either gender or age group or one, you know, uh, this one person or these, this group of people that are facing this certain issue inside of their life. But, but when we come to talk about temptation, we're, we're talking about, I have the privilege of addressing a subject that every single one of us are familiar with what it is. In fact, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and he said, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. And so we understand that temptation is something that is common to every single individual. It, it doesn't matter how long you've been saved. Uh, it, it doesn't matter what church you attend. It doesn't matter how much of the Bible you've read this past week, how often you met with the Lord in prayer. Temptation is a common part of the believer's experience in this life. And, and one of the operative words that, that we need to understand this morning that is a relevant part of the subject of temptation is the word subtlety. Subtlety is a very operative word in, in understanding what temptation is, is all about. Uh, the concept of temptation is found in every occurrence of temptation that you and I face as individuals. Subtlety is a part of every single temptation that, that comes our way. In fact, James says it like this in James chapter 1 and verse number 14, that a person is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And, and that's really it, isn't it? That, that the temptations that you and I face are temptations that appeal to our fleshly, carnal senses. In other words, you're probably not so tempted by the witch with warts all over her face. That's probably not temptation for you. Temptation is something that is in, enticeful. It is something that is that is appealing. Something something that is that is tasty. Something something that is enjoyable, if you will. And, and therefore, it's here that that we learn what temptation really is. It's it's subtle in its very nature. The idea of subtlety is it flies below the radar. It doesn't make advertisements. It's not on commercials as far as saying, hey, this is what we are. This is the plan of the attack of the devil, the world, the flesh coming at you. This is how it's going to happen. No, no, subtlety means that temptation flies up underneath the radar. It doesn't announce itself. It, it camouflages itself and it shows up out of nowhere and disappears all in the same venue, if you will. The very thought of temptation is at the forefront of mankind's total demise. His failure begins with the first temptation. His beginning of sorrows took place with Adam and Eve all the way back in the Garden of Eden as they faced the very temptation hurled at humanity. And we're told in that setting inside of Genesis chapter number 3 that the serpent itself was more subtle than any other beast of the field. Now, the idea of subtlety here, I want to be very careful to make this, make this clear to us. The idea of subtlety is a neutral term, meaning that subtlety in and of itself isn't good or bad. It's, it's a neutral term. Uh, in, in other words, subtlety could be used in a positive or in a good sense. In fact, you and I are told inside of the New Testament that we are to be as wise as serpents. And the wisdom of a serpent in that terminology is linked to the subtlety that's associated with a serpent, the, the camouflage, if you will, that's associated with them. And so subtlety in that sense is, is kind of good. And all that means is not that you're sneaky, not that you're deceptive or, or conniving or anything like that, but just that everything doesn't always need to be announced, all right? Just a, a real quick, maybe, maybe funny or maybe you aren't in the mood to laugh and if that's the case, you're going to have a hard go of it here in just a little while, all right? Uh, so uh, uh, just to kind of help us to understand a, a good sense of, of subtlety, you know, if you have a piece of broccoli in your teeth, you don't want your guest at dinner that night to stand up and announce to the whole entire restaurant that you have a piece of broccoli in your teeth, right? You want some kind of Morse code, you know, tap, 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 you know, and, and subtlety, right? That's, that's the idea. If you've done something that, you know, if you've got toilet paper stuck to the bottom of your shoe or whatever the case is. So, so you, you understand in a kind of a funny, facetious way, some of you aren't going to laugh, I'll preach to you hard here in just a minute, amen. Uh, uh, so, so, so subtlety 
can be a positive, can be a good thing, but it can also be a negative thing. But it's neutral. And so, and so subtlety is really, whether it's going to be good or bad, is left up to the person's hands that subtlety is placed into. And so Satan here tells, the Bible tells us in Genesis 3 that Satan takes possession of a serpent and therefore uses the subtlety associated with the serpent in a very evil way, a very, a very bad way. So Satan is going to camouflage what he's doing. In other words, and, and we all know this, just to be reminded of it, in Genesis 3, the devil doesn't show up in possession of the serpent and announce to Eve, hey, I'm here to make sure you die today. That's not what Satan does. Satan doesn't show up and say, hey, hey, I'm here to ruin your relationship with God and to make sure that not only you die, but that your children die. Satan, Satan doesn't say to Eve, hey, hey, I'm here to completely ruin your life so much so that you're going to have to bury one of your children because your other child kills him. Satan doesn't do that. What does Satan do? Satan camouflages himself. He uses subtlety in his attack. New Testament terminology tells us that Satan has devices. He has tricks. He has schemes. He has wiles. He has a plan. He manipulates. He, he flies up underneath the radar. He doesn't let you know what he's doing. In fact, what he's doing will seem appealing. It will, it will entice you. It will, it will seem tasteful and enjoyable to you. That's what he wants. He wants to grab you in that arena, if you will. And if he can, then he's got you. If he can do the same thing to you that he did to Eve and get you to admit that the fruit on the tree that is forbidden is good, pleasant to the eye, a, a, a tree to be desired to make one wise. If he can get you to succumb to his methodology, then he's got you hook, line, and sinker. And so he flies under the radar. Again, devices, schemes, tactics. The Bible, New Testament even speaks of his attacks against us. That he walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Again, not announcing himself while he's, while he's a mile off that he's on his way. But, but, but all, almost at the time that, that when you realize what he's doing, it's almost too late and, and the attack has already been launched in your direction. Right. And, and, and here's one of the problems, I think, with, with meeting an enemy. You, you know, if, if we were on a battlefield and, and the enemy shows its face and, and there's, there's my opponent, that's one thing. That's one, and I'm not, 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 not saying that's going to make it a whole lot easier, you know, not, not saying victory is guaranteed, but if I can at least perceive, see the enemy, know that he's there and kind of what he's up to, then, then, then we've got a battle on our hands. What makes warfare so much more difficult is when the enemy disguises himself as a friend. And when it sneaks in beside you and establishes a relationship and makes you think that what they're interested in is your good and your benefit, that makes warfare complete. That's a traitor. That's a spy. That's someone that comes in very sneaky and manipulates you. And listen to me, that is one of the tactics that the devil uses in subtlety. He comes alongside of you. He, he's, not that, he's not that red little imp that pops up on your shoulder with, with horns and a long pointy tail and pitchforks. He's camouflaged in he, And he comes in seeking whom he may devour. Now, for those of you that have often wondered as you've read through the scriptures and read certain words and terminologies and phrases from, from the scriptures and you've wondered what is the distinction between the test of God and the test that the devil kind of hurls at us because the Bible uses those terms test, trials, and temptations even kind of interchangeably. And so how do you distinguish between the reality that God doesn't tempt us with evil and really Satan doesn't tempt us with good? How do you, how do you make that distinction? Well, here it is if you've ever wondered that. The, the test that God will give you throughout the course of your life as a believer will be a test to advance you. It will be a test to promote you. God, God came to Abraham in Genesis 22. The Bible says that God did tempt Abraham. He put Abraham to the test. Why? Was God interested in Abraham failing that day? Absolutely not. God was interested in Abraham's success. He is, he is testing him for the benefit of promoting him. Not so with Satan. 
When Satan tempts an individual, he is not tempting him to promote him. Satan tempts you for the sole purpose of flunking you. He wants to completely wreck and ruin your life. He doesn't have any kind of good intention at all towards you. It's kind of like that, you know, maybe when you're in school, maybe some of you are in school today, and if you are in school and your teacher is inside this congregation this morning, Please don't make any kind of, you know, gestures at all, okay? But, but you know, sometimes you kind of, every once in a while you'd have a kid uh, or a teacher in school. You remember me in school? And you just kind of felt like that teacher was out to get you. I had like 13 of them straight in a row, amen, all the way from kindergarten to 12th grade, amen. And, and you just kind of feel like that teacher just out to get you, like they, they care nothing about you, they hate your guts, amen. Just, I, I mean, Miss Tracy's mama was one of my teachers, and that's why, no, I'm just kidding, amen. And so, you know, you, but you, you have them every once in a while. Brother, uh, uh, Brother Ryan's in college, he probably has a professor, I like that, amen. They just feel like they just want to flunk you, amen. And they, how many times has your kid last year come home and, uh, and, and they didn't make good on a, on a test score and they said mama I promise they they never even covered that subject she just she just doing that to get me she don't like me amen don't that sound like a teenager <laughs> and uh, and so we're not talking about that kind of a teacher when you're talking about God when you're talking about God you're talking about a teacher that gives a test that that is doing that for your benefit for your good so so that you apply what you've already learned and so that you can make progress in your life there's there's the idea of of the distinction between what Satan is trying to do in your life and what what God's doing in your life. God's interested in your good. In fact, the Bible says, Romans 8, 28, that all things that God does works together for good to them that love the Lord, to them that are called according to his purpose. Not so with Satan. The Bible tells about Satan uh, uh, that, he, uh, uh, that, that he is a, a liar and the father of it, and that he came uh, uh, to steal, kill, and destroy. Are you listening to me? That's exactly what Satan wants to do to your life. Now again, he's not going to advertise that. He's not going to write that on a piece of paper, get it notarized, and mail it to you later on this week. But that's his intention inside your life. And so there is the distinction. And Satan accomplishes that stealing from you, that manipulating, manipulating of you, and even the destroying of your life. He accomplishes all of that through the methodology of subtle temptations camouflaging his intentions coming in and destroying your life and there's two really kinds of of subtlety in regards to temptation there is well, the the first one we, we would call uh enticements if you will there's uh there's the subtlety of being enticed in, in, in other words the subtlety of, of enticement is oh i see something and it looks appealing it looks good, and Satan oftentimes works through things that are appealing, things that look good, seem good. Maybe even you, you, you think they, it smells good, and it looks good. It's got to taste good. It's got to feel good. And, and so there's that enticement. It looks so beautiful, so marvelous, so well put together. And, and, and subconsciously you think if it looks that good, smells that good, then, then, then it can't be that Bad, and so there's an enticement. And Satan loves to operate in that realm. And he'll put things like that all around you. He'll put things like that in your neighborhood. He'll put things like that in your city. He'll put things like that in your school. He'll put things like that in your home. He'll put things like that in your youth group, in your church. He'll put those kinds of enticements all around you, things that just simply look good, and therefore they kind of lure you in. Another form of subtle temptations would be what we would call a distraction. Here's, here's what I use most of the time whenever I go hunting. I use a subtle temptation for deer or for really any animal that is stupid enough to come in there. I use, I use a distraction. And here's what I do. It. And for those of you animal lovers here, sorry. All right. Uh, but, uh, but I will take a, you know, some kind of bait, corn or something like that. Amen. And, and I'll put out there and I'll distract the deer. All right. And what I'm doing is I'm letting him feed his belly. I put a distraction, and now he's focused on the corn, and he doesn't see the big rifle <laughs> up here. Amen. If he was looking at the rifle, he understood what the rifle was doing. Hopefully the deer is smart enough. Maybe he's graduated to third grade, and he would understand the deer needs to run off. Amen. But I distract him. I camouflage myself. I sit up there, and I sweat bullets. Amen. And I get attacked by mosquitoes, and I get up early. I leave an air-conditioned house. I leave a, 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 a beautiful family, a wife in the bed, all the comforts to go out there and to sweat. And here's the reality. I don't even eat the stupid meat either. And so I don't know why I do that. Amen. Uh, but, uh, but I do all of that, and I'm distracting 
That animal. Listen, sometimes, sometimes that's an attack of the devil. Because what he'll do, listen to me, stay with me now. He'll get you so distracted by everything else. Listen, he'll, he'll get you focused on, on, on one thing in your life. And while you're focusing on that, I think that's a, I think that's a problem with some ministries. Sometimes I think we get so focused on some of the big things, even, even things that are wrong, things that are sin, and we'll focus all our attention on some of those big areas. And while we're focused on some of those big areas, we don't even notice that Satan snuck in the back door. And, and that's all of a sudden, that's kind of crept in. You understand? So there's enticements and there's distractions in our life that, that we're going to have to face periodically, all right? The, the New Testament teaches us, here's, here's one of the things that I've absolutely loved finding out. Take your Bible, hold your place here in Matthew 4. I promise we're going to come back here and deal with this text at large, but I want you to see this over in the book of Hebrews chapter number 2. Hebrews chapter number 2, we don't do this a lot moving around, but just to kind of help us see this, this one, I'll make a statement, then I'm going to show it to you inside of the Bible. The New Testament teaches us that one of the top priorities of Jesus was to experience temptation. I don't know if you realize that or not. But one of the top priorities of Jesus in his earthly ministry was to experience temptation. And not just to experience it, but it was something that was going to be accomplished through him experiencing temptation that we read about in Matthew 4. Hebrews chapter 2, listen to it, verse number 17. The writer says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him, that is Christ, it, it pleased Christ, it pleased him to be made like unto his brethren, that is, become a man, that he might be a merciful and, high, and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. There's a wonderful facet of the earthly ministry of Christ. God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ so that he could be your go between, uh, uh, amen, your intercessor, your, your high priest, and make an atonement for your sin. Jesus did that, dying on the cross. Say amen, right? We got that? But notice what it says in verse number 18. For in that he himself hath suffered being, what? Tempted. He is able to succor them that are tempted. That's, that's an old English word. That means that he is able to help. He's able to aid, to come to your rescue. Now, now, now notice, I made this statement. One of Jesus' top priorities in his earthly ministry was to experience temptation. The Bible says in verse number 17 in Hebrews chapter 2 that it pleased Christ. It was a very good thing in the mind of Christ to become a man so that he could suffer the, the, the idea, the experiences of temptation. Why? Verse number 18 tells us so that he could help you and me when we're tempted. I don't know about you, but I find great encouragement in that. To know that a good God of all glory would leave the realms of heaven and come down here and suffer, not only just suffer and die, but to make sure while he was here, he would, he would experience temptation. For, and one of the great benefits of him experiencing temptation is so that when you and I face those temptations periodically through our life, he can help us through every temptation that comes to pass in our life. In fact, as the gospel narrative opens, we find that God becomes us in the person of Jesus Christ. He who is holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. He became us. Luke tells us that around the age of 30, Jesus would launch into his ministerial life. He's going he's to start fulfilling the purpose that he actually came to fulfill in his life. In Matthew chapter 3, we have the baptism of Jesus, kind of that launching point into the earthly ministry of Christ where Jesus is baptized by God's authorized baptizer, John the Baptist. Say amen. And a man, a man with a leather girdle on uh, with, uh, with, with honey and, and, and grasshoppers sticking out of his mouth. Amen. I mean, you're talking about old-fashioned preacher, praise God. Amen. And, and, so, and so John baptizes Jesus and, and launches him. Uh, 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 theologians have called that the inauguration of the king or, or the commissioning of Christ into his earthly work. He came. Why? To seek and to save that which was lost. And, and here's the beginning point of that public ministry that Christ came to accomplish. He's baptized. He comes up out of the water and he's ready to go, right? And what you might expect as you come to the conclusion of Matthew 3 and as Matthew chapter 4 opens, you would expect to see maybe, if you didn't know the Bible, if we hadn't already read it this morning, you would expect to see immediately, Matthew 4 verse number 1, Jesus goes on an evangelistic crusade mission. 
You'd expect to read something that Jesus went back into Judea and He set up a big tent meeting and made Him a wooden pulpit and opened His King James Bible up and began preaching the gospel. That's what you would expect to see. I mean, He's just been baptized, the inauguration of the King, the commissioning of Christ into His earthly ministry to seek and to save that which was lost. Let's get it started with a big preaching revival. That's kind of, I don't know about you, but that's kind of what, what I, if I was writing it down and if I was just kind of, you know, make believe on it, that's what I would expect would fill in the blank in Matthew chapter number four. But that is not at all what we find. In fact, in fact, here's how Mark words it in Mark chapter one and verse number 12. The spirit driveth him into the wilderness. He's not just Matthew chapter four, verse one. He's not just led up. Into, of the Spirit into the wilderness. That's true. Absolutely true. Say amen. Absolutely true. But it's not just, it's not just a casual, you know, like a, like a shepherd leading, a, leading a, his sheep. It's being driven. He's driving him there. And I think Mark uses that, that expression, that terminology to again show us that this is a high priority on God's to-do list for his son. Uh, God is saying this is imperative. I, I, this is something that, that immediately needs to be accomplished for, for my son to go and to be tempted of the devil in the wilderness, the temptation of Jesus was a high priority on God's to-do list. Let's ask the question, why? Why was this such a top priority of God for His Son? Again, Hebrews chapter 2 tells us that the reason this is a top priority is because God wanted to make sure that you and I have the help that we would so desperately need in every temptation that we would face. Would you listen to another verse of scripture with me this morning? Amen. Also in Hebrews, just two chapters later on Hebrews chapter four, you know this verse well. Hebrews chapter four and verse number 15, the Bible says that Jesus was in all points tempted like as we are. Remember reading that? That he, Jesus, was in all points tempted like as we are tempted to sin. And yet, and yet the Bible says, yet he was without sin. He was tempted in all points. Now, I want you to remember that expression. We're going to come back around to that in a minute. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. No sin, but he did. He faced every single temptation, right? Is, is that what the Bible says? Am I to assume this morning that Jesus literally, individually faced every minute temptation that's available to me and to you today. I don't know, do you think Jesus had an iPhone? I don't know, do you think Jesus had in, in, in the streets of Judea and Galilee and even passing through Samaria, did they have billboards on the side of the road like you and I have? I, I, I don't think Jesus was probably ever tempted to snort crack cocaine up his nose, okay? I'm just, I'm just guessing that wasn't a prevalent problem 2,000 years ago in the Middle East, okay? What, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get you to make sense of is when Hebrews 4.15 says that he was tempted in all points like as we are, it's not telling us that he faced every minute individual temptation that you and I will ever face. That's not what the words mean in Hebrews 4.15. Please, I, I want to I see if I can make this make sense. Y'all smile at me this morning. How y'all doing? Everybody doing okay? Amen. Let's look at it like this. Let's say you play on a ball team. Now, for some of you, I've seen you play, and this is a stretch, all right? But let's just say that you play on a, on a ball team. Hunter, I'm thinking about you. Amen. And, uh, amen. I'm guessing you didn't get a scholar. I'm just kidding. Amen. All right. So you play on a ball team, all right? And let's say that on this ball team, you're going to play every game that you play in one, on one, of three fields. That's all. Every single game you play is going to be played on one of three fields in one of three stadiums. Every game. Now, now, what's interesting is you're going to face a lot of different opponents. I mean, there's more than three opponents. I mean, there may be 12, 15, 20 different opponents that you're going to play every year of your life. And there's going to be different circumstances as you play against those different opponents. Sometimes the sun's going to be shining. Sometimes it's going to be raining. It may be snowing. The wind may be blowing. It may be in the middle of the day. It may be a 9 o'clock game. It may be something late at night. What, what, different circumstances. 
and different opponents and therefore different levels of difficulty. Some opponents are going to be a little bit more difficult. Some you're going to kind of, you know, they're going to throw it right across the plate and you're just going, you know, knock it out of the park. Amen. Other times you're going to get up there and you're going to swing and miss three times in a row and go back and sit down and, and, and chew on chewing gum. Y'all thought I was going to say chewing tobacco, didn't you? Amen. And so that's what you're going to do. And, and it's going to be a little bit more difficult. And sometimes you're going to be out there and, the, and it's going to be a little wet. And you might slide into a little mud puddle. And you, you understand. But every game, you're on the ball team now. Amen. Some of y'all use your imagination. You haven't done that in a while. You're on the ball team. And you're going to play all these different opponents in all these different circumstances, but every game you play is going to be played in one, oh, one of three different fields. That's what it means when the Bible says Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are. Not that he faced every individual opponent in every various circumstance that you might, but it means that he got well familiar with each of those three stadiums of temptation that are common to man. Isn't that, isn't that what Paul said to the church at Corinth? That, that, that there's no temptation taking you, that's happened to you, but such as is common to man. In other words, you hadn't faced anything today that they didn't face 3,000 years ago. Well, how can that be? They didn't have television back then. They didn't have some of the districts. They didn't have, listen, you know, you know what the Bible says about last days? That there'll be inventors of evil things. That means we've made up things to do wrong today that they didn't even have back there. So they couldn't have been tempted to do them back there, right? And so, and so here's the idea, though. There's a lot of different opponents, and someone new this year may join the league. And we may play somebody this year that we've never played before in our life. But you can bet on one thing. You will face them in one of those same three arenas. Now, what are those three stadiums, those three arenas? Well, John tells us, 1 John chapter 2, verse number 16, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And every temptation you'll ever face in your life will be played on one of those three fields. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. In fact, if we were to go all the way back to that first temptation in Genesis chapter number three, that's the, that's the, the playing field that Eve played on against Satan in Genesis chapter number three. Lust of the flesh, uh, or lust, lust of the eyes. This is what she saw. She saw the tree that it was good. A tree to be desired. I mean, it looked good. It was, a, it was a tree that was pleasant. The lust of the eyes. I see it and it looks right. Amen. And then the lust of the flesh. Well, it's, it's probably, if it looks that good, it's got to taste that good. It could satisfy a need. I didn't eat breakfast this morning. I forgot to stop by the orange orchard. Amen. I didn't pick any grapes off the vine. The blueberry bushes were dried up this morning. Whatever the case is. Amen. And so there's, a, there's an opportunity for me to feel a carnal appetite in my life. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Amen. A tree to be desired to make one wise. This really made me something because I was in that in crowd. I mean, if I knowed everything God knows. <laughs> I mean, if I, you mean tell me I can be like God? Where do I sign at? Amen. Do I need to initial anywhere? Put the date? What is the date? I have no idea. Amen. And so there's the idea. Now, now you say, oh yeah, that was back, you know, 6,000 years ago in Genesis chapter 3. Well, fast forward 4,000 years of humanity's history and you wind up in the days of Christ, Matthew chapter 4, Jesus in the wilderness being driven by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted of the devil. What's the playing fields? that Jesus is going to meet Satan on. Same fields. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Lust, lust of the flesh. He had not eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. That doesn't sound that much. That's 960 hours. I'm preaching a Baptist. You get up in the middle of the night and eat a snack. Amen. 960 hours. I mean, I look at those, uh, I got whatever, Nature's Way, I think is what they're called. They're, they're supposed to taste like a, like a payday, but it tastes more like cardboard with salt, a little bit of salt. Probably sea salt at that on it. Somebody tell me how you get salt out the sea. I didn't think you could do that. But anyway, hey, and, and so I look at that thing and it says, it says uh, uh, energy for four hours. Look at me, I'm going to sue them jokers for false advertisement. I ain't never ate one of them things that felt good for four hours. 30 minutes later, I'm about to starve. I mean, my stomach starts eating my rib cage. I mean, I'm losing weight. Amen. It took me 36 years to get this big. I'm not trying to do that. And so, uh, amen. And, and Jesus had been 960 hours without eating. And what's the first thing Satan does? Hey, take them stones, make them bread. Lust of the flesh. Lust, lust of the eyes. 
I mean, you mean to tell me I can get up here on this pinnacle and I can, I can do a somersault off the pinnacle and everybody can see me? I mean, yeah, man. Pride of life. You mean all I got to do is bow my knee and all the kingdoms of the world will be mine and I can, I can circumvent around the cross, Gethsemane, none of that. I don't have to do any of that. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. 2,000 years past that. Here we are today. July, what, 18, 2021. And you know what Satan's fight? You know what three fields you'll play Satan? No, this week, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. It'll look good. It'll taste good. It'll smell good. You'll think it is good. You'll think how it can, how it it can physically satisfy you. It can quench some urge or desire that you've got. And boy, won't you be in the in crowd? Because why? Everybody else is doing it. Yeah. He was tempted in every single point, every area, every category that you'll be tempted in. And yet, the Bible says, without sin. <laughs> without sin. Jesus played, if you will, in all three stadiums so he could help you win. It's amazing. And in this temptation, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus comes just as close to sin as he possibly could have and still be your Savior. You ever thought about that? If I, I believe this on my heart. I, I believe if Jesus had have taken one more step in sin's direction, he'd be unfit to be your savior. He came as close. That's, that's Hebrews 4. He was tempted in all points like a, I mean, faced everything you'll face. And then so much so that the Bible writer has to almost put in a parenthetical and say, but he didn't see him though. I mean, he got as close to it as he could have. Now, what would have happened if Jesus would have stepped over the line? Well, well, possibly what would have happened is you would have had somebody that could have said, hey, yeah, been there, done that, here's what I learned from it. But that's not what you needed. What you needed is for somebody to say, I went toe-to-toe. I went face to face with the devil in that same stadium. And listen, I beat him for you. <laughs> Amen. That's what you, you need a savior. You need someone who could go to the cross and die. And so that's what Jesus does. Yeah, I mean, he's ready to get there. I mean, we kind of look at Jesus, the Roman Catholic version of Jesus is, is that he's kind of all shriveled up and he's got, he's got blue eyes and long blonde hair. Somebody tell me how a Jew looked like that, amen? More like a, more like a Hollywood superstar. Somebody say, and, 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 and he's still on the cross. By the way, he's not there. <laughs> amen, she's empty this morning. Eh? But, eh, but we look at him and he's all drawn up. And, no, 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 that's a wrong image that we're portraying. By the way, they didn't have Polaroids back then. Amen. And so here's the idea of Jesus in Matthew 4 is he ain't a bit scared of the devil. Hey. Amen. In fact, in fact, he says, I'm going out food 90, 960 hours and I'll still meet your carcass out here in the wilderness. Yeah. Hey. I mean, he's a man. I mean, he's ready for it. Amen. And he goes out there. Why? Because, because he's going there to make sure 2,000 years later you can make it through temptation oh, yeah. to your face. Amen. What a savior. Now, now, Jesus knows. I'm going to get down to preaching here in just a minute, all right? Jesus knows everything you need to know to be successful in your temptations. Now, he's been to the fields. Brother Mason, he knows how far apart the bases are. He knows, he knows if there's any difference. He knows where the out-of-bounds lines are. He knows if there's a hole up underneath the fence somewhere, amen? I mean, he, know, he knows if there's grass in the infield or if it's all, or if it's all clay dirt out there. I mean, he knows, he knows how well manicured it is. I mean, he knows about the dugouts. The, he knows how high the walls are, how far it is to the right field, fence line, left field. Center. He knows every, I mean, every detail you need in order to be successful. He's got where the sun, hey, is the sun going to be in my eyes if I'm playing left field, right? Everything. Every, some of y'all are going to go home and watch ESPN this afternoon, ain't you, amen? He knows everything. And, and in... This experience in Matthew chapter 4, he passes along the information that you and I need for the answer to temptation. Three things. Three things that Jesus shows us. How does Jesus help us with temptation? In, the, in this particular text of Scripture, Jesus shows us, number one, he shows us the tactics that the devil will use. The tactics that the devil will use. You, you jot it down somewhere in your notes or in the margin of your Bible. Temptation is not always a direct assault. It's not. Temptation is not always a direct assault. When you and I think about temptation, we think about temptation in obvious terms. We think about drugs 
alcohol, sexual immorality. Uh, we, we think about robbing banks and being a, a serial killer. All right? uh, we, we think about a direct enticement to do something opposite from the explicit teaching of the Word of God. And listen, sometimes it happens. Like I'm not saying sometimes. Sometimes, every once in a while, it happens like that. But not normally. What Jesus shows us here in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus shows us that temptation is not always as noticeable. The allurement to sin is not always as obvious as we would like for it to be. L let me ask you a question to help this make sense. The first temptation that Jesus faces in Matthew chapter number 4 is to take stones and to make them bread. Here's the question. Is turning stones into bread a sin? Please don't answer that out loud. Is turning stones into bread a sin? Now let me ask you in a little bit different way, all right? Where in the Bible is turning stones into bread forbidden? I mean, it's like double jeopardy time right here, right? Where? I mean, let's go to Genesis. You know, flip through it, can't find it. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We've exhausted the Old Testament law. Maybe one of the historical books. Maybe, maybe Judges or Joshua, you know. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings. Maybe Ezra, Nehemiah. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe in the poetical, you know, portion of the Old Testament. Maybe the prophetical books of the Bible. Is it? I mean, what about, what about New Testament? Maybe, maybe it was a revelation that hadn't been given yet, and Paul was going to make that mystery known as well. And so you turn to those Pauline epistles, and, and you look at Romans and 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, all through the New Testament, and you know what you find after all of that? Is there's never anywhere in the Bible where taking stones and making them into bread is explicitly forbidden on the pages of Scripture. Now stay with me. Y'all say amen to that? Yeah. And yet, if Jesus would have taken one stone and turned it into half a loaf of bread, he'd have failed the temptation. He'd have failed the test, and you and I would never have had a fit Savior. <laughs> now, how, what would have been the failure? <laughs> because it's not black and white. And that's where we love to live at. That's what we say. That's what younger generations always say. Not just this generation. That's what younger generations love to say to older generations. Is, well, it ain't in the Bible. We need this cornbread. Amen? Listen, listen. Everything doesn't have to be laid out black and white. The Bible doesn't address everything black and white. It doesn't. The Bible's not so much a book of absolute imperatives as it is a book of general guiding principles. Now, I'm not saying there aren't some direct. There's 613 precepts under the Old Testament law. It has a lot of imperatives, a lot of direct commands. But there's a lot of things. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, one of the characteristics that showed that you were lost, dying, and on the way to hell was not that you violated just the Ten Commandments, but it's that you walked according to the pattern of this world. The course. Just the fact that you got in line with the way the lost world is living was evidence of the fact that you belong to a devil's hell. Yes, Who walked? You were dead in trespasses and sins. You walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. That's, that characterized lost folk before the grace of God appeared inside their life. It's not always so easy to cut and dry. Don't die in that ditch of it's got to be black and white. Because here's what God said, you just come out from among them and be saved. Amen. That's what, that's what some, sometimes you try to help folks, try, try to give them advice. And, and, and they'll just, well, I just don't see it. You don't have to see everything to believe in it. Otherwise, you wouldn't suck the air that you're breathing right now. Tactics. There's, there's tactics that are being used. Temptation is not always a direct assault. So what was the infringement? Now, now you can read commentaries and listen to theologians and folks that are a whole lot smarter than me and I can't even pronounce all the letters that come after their name. Look like another alphabet sometimes. Amen? And, and a, lot, a, lot, a lot of things that I think is a lot simpler than that. What infringement would Jesus have made to turn stones into bread? Well, to turn stones into bread would have shown that Jesus relied on nourishment for survival in exchange for the very power of God. What's Jesus' response? Man shall not live. we got to hurry up. Amen. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. 
Now that latter expression, every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God, is not so much a reference to the Bible as much as it is to the authority and power of God Himself. In other words, Jesus is calling attention to the reality that I don't live another day because I ate a loaf of bread today. I live another day because God said I live another day. To put it in the words of Job, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. In fact, in fact, now I'm, I'm, I'm for Stanley eating. I want y'all to know that. Amen. I'm pro, I'm pro eating lunch today. All right. But the reality is, and, and that's, a, that's a normal law. Please don't put this in test today, amen. That's a normal law. you got to eat to stay alive. But you can stay alive without eating. And just to help you out, some of y'all be interested in that, you go back to the Old Testament, and Moses fasted not 40 days in a row, but he went 80 straight days without eating. And God kept him alive. Something that's physically, scientifically impossible for a person to do and still function. But God said, said, what I say goes, and I say you live even though you hadn't eaten, and therefore Moses stayed alive. You can say amen to that. You can say amen and check it out later on. All right? What, what, what are we saying? We're saying that Jesus here understood the principle that, that I'm going to rely on God and not on anything else for the survival of my life. The course of action, if taken by Jesus, would have taken him down the wrong path of trusting his appetites more than his father. What I want is more important than the direction the Bible's pushing me in. It's a problem. It's a temptation to sin. The temptation that you and I will face will not always come from someone flinging themselves into our arms. It's not always going to come from some dope dealer on the corner trying to sell you some illegal narcotics. That's not the only kinds of temptations that you and I are going to face on a regular basis in our life. They are going to fly underneath the radar. You're not going to notice them. And your mom and daddy may not notice them. And your pastor may not notice them. And what, what Jesus is showing us, He's helping us. He says, I've been to the arena. I know how He plays. I know how the devil plays the game. And He said, you've got to, you've got to understand this. That it's not always going to be a direct assault. You're going to have to exercise some wisdom and learn to read between the lines. Is this going to take me closer in dependence on God or is this going to take me further away from dependence on God? Number two, we're going to get through these next ones real quick like, all right? Number two, jot down the second word is the word circumstances. Circumstances. Now, now again, here's a problem for us. Here's a big problem for us. Because I know I, know I have this tendency to believe. I, I think in a fanciful world that I'm going to face temptation right after every church service or at least right after my morning devotions. You say, preach, what do you mean by that? I, I mean like I'm gunning to face Satan after a good church service like this right here because, I, man, I feel, man, like good right now, you know? I mean, did you hear the choir sing? <laughs> I mean, praise God. I mean, the special music saved us far. I mean, I felt like running a lap. If I could do that and still preach, I'd have done it. And, and look, great and Brother John reading the scriptures and praying. I mean, I was listening to some of the words that he was saying, and I was thinking, man, that's amazing. And just, just the spirit and, and seeing y'all out there and, and then having the Bible open in front of me this morning and being able to read and talk about the Word of God. I mean, like I'm thinking, I'm thinking if Satan wants to pop his head up after, after church this morning, I'll pop his head like a pimple. Somebody say, man. I mean, man, I'm ready for that. I mean, I'm Jones. I mean, tonight after service, we come back and, and everything. I mean, I'm thinking me and Mitchell around, let Satan pop up, man. We'll give him something to remember. I get out of my, out of my closet in the morning from praying and read the Bible. I mean, I'm ready for that sucker. But you know what Jesus shows us here in this temptation? It don't always come at your strongest point in time. 960 hours without eating. And isn't it ironic that the first temptation the old stupid devil throws at, Satan, uh, throws at Jesus is to take stones and make them bread. I mean, the weakest part of his life at that point, that's where Satan meets him at. And doesn't that take us back to what James said? 1 verse 14. Every man's tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. Can I help you with that? Every man faces temptation in, in the area of his life that's desirable. 
what's, what's really going on in the inside. If that's what you're craving, if that's what you're constantly thinking about, don't you think the devil's smart enough to throw something out there that's appealing to you? I mean, look, I'm not, I'm not here to, to pick on anybody this morning. I hope you, I hope you won't get that. But I, I've never been tempted to drink alcohol. I just, I, I never have. I've, I've, I, when, I was a, when I was a real young person, I took a couple of swallows, and I thought I was going to die. And, and so it, I mean, you know, like Mountain Dew tastes a lot better. Say amen. amen. And so I just, even before I was saved, it just wasn't, and then I understand the scriptures after that, and thank God for a good pastor, good youth leader to kind of help put me in, in the right direction. And so I, when I say, like I have, I'm like Brother Mason, amen, I got zero interest in it at all. And so to go sit down and eat a steak at Applebee's, if you want to buy my lunch today, I'll go sit down with you, and we'll eat, and, and we'll have a good, and I'll face, I'll face none because, because that's, not, that's not what Brother Stanley struggles at. And so I don't find Satan leaving, leaving half-drunk beer bottles on my doorstep when I wake up in the, in the morning, tempting me in that area. Oh, stupid devil smart enough to know, though, where I do struggle at. And you better believe every day, all week long, he's throwing things out, left and right, trying to get us. And usually, usually, it comes when I hadn't been praying like I should have. When I hadn't been reading my Bible, skip church Wednesday night, it won't be that important to me. I had some other things going on. And Sunday, Sunday night's just, you know, I got so much, I got to get ready for the week. And I didn't come back Sunday night. And whenever I get weak and depleted, one preacher said, I know it's, it was kind of, you know, funny to think about it like that, but at a youth meeting when I was a teenager, heard a preacher say, never, never forgot, just kind of one of those things that, that stick with you, is that if you give the devil an inch, he'll take 12 and be your ruler. And, and that's, that's kind of simple to think about it like, but it's right, isn't it? You just give the devil just a little open door in, in a weak moment, and he's got you. N number three, and then we're going to be finished this morning. Jesus shows us the prescription here for temptation, the prescription. What hope do you and I have to fight off temptation? I need to know that, don't you? Because I'm going to face it, and I, I'm facing it, and I will face it. I have faced it. It's a prevalent part of my life, and it's a prevalent part. Of, it's common to man. All of us go through that. So, so let me ask you another question that hopefully will lead us in the right direction to finding out where the, the, the answer really is to temptation. Here, here's, a, here's the question. Do you have a tendency to lean on your feelings or to lean on the Word of God in decisive moments? Which one are you more prone to lean on? If there was a real important decision that had to be made right now in your life, would you, would you search the scriptures and prayerfully consider what the Bible has to say on the subject? Or are you more prone to lean towards your feelings and say, well, if I make that decision, I can make more money. We can live in a better area. We can have a nicer house. We can have blah, 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 blah. You have more of a tendency to lean on your feelings or to lean on the counsel of the Word of God in decisive moments. The majority of us, if we were honest, would have to say that we're more prone to lean on our feelings. And we may not say it in this exact verbiage, but what we're thinking is something like this. Well, I feel like... And look, I'm not saying that God doesn't operate through emotions. I'm not one of those dead folks, all right? But what I am saying is let God be true and every man a liar. And your feelings are subjective meaning that they are apt to change with the weather that bible won't Amen. you better learn to trust the bible lean on the bible we'll, we'll, we'll say things like this right here we'll say well, well i don't feel like that's wrong i don't you know like 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 two thousand years of christianity is all boiled down in how you felt when you woke up this morning like God just so haphazardly built his church on the way you feel as an individual this morning. And if you feel like it's okay, then it's got to be right. Well, I don't feel like it's wrong. I, 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 I don't feel like God cares about that. I mean, that's just, you know, like the one that left heaven, wrapped himself in a body of flesh, pleased to dwell among us, went to the cross, bled and died for us. 
stayed dead on 72 hours later, got up from the grave, amen, conquered death, hell, and the grave. 40 days later, ascended back into heaven, sitting, sitting with his back kind of arched, ready to get up, amen, and come back and take us out of this world, has, has sovereign control over everything going on. One day had come, put down all authority, rule and reign with a rod of iron a thousand years, and then me and you live with him for eons upon eons, ages and ages, and yet you think that God just don't care about this? This feels right. This feels good. And, and if we're not careful, you and I will let our feelings be our guide. M- may I just point out here, as we close this morning, Matthew chapter 4, m- may I just point out that at any point in time, Jesus may have said, you know, eating a loaf of bread would really feel good right now. <laughs> Man, that, you're right, devil. It sure would feel good to have a, one of them big old yeast rolls from Golden Corral with some butter on it. That would feel good. He, he, he could have said, you know, I don't feel like it would be wrong to show everybody that I really am God's son. Good point, Satan. I think I'll get up here and do a gainer off the top of the pinnacle of the temple and that would feel really good for everybody to know that I'm God's son. You're right. You, you know, I, I feel like my Father in heaven would be okay with what I do as long as I get control of the world. You know, the, the, the directions and everything, they may vary a little bit. But as long as I feel like. <laughs> but again and again and again. You know what Jesus said? It is written. <laughs> By the way, three pitches thrown. Every single one of them. Listen, if Jesus would have made the opposite decision in any three of those areas, he would have failed and not been a fit Savior. All of them. And yet Jesus responds all three times with an appeal to God's Word. It is written. It is written. Interesting. I don't know if there's something to it. But all of the quotations that Jesus makes all come from the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, chapter 6, verse 13, and chapter 6, verse number 16. I don't know, maybe we need to study the book of Deuteronomy, maybe a little bit more. But, but all three, and, and that's interesting, because Jesus is stepping on the New Testament ground without a New Testament and without, without the fulfillment, without the institution of, of the New Testament. And yet he appeals to the Mosaic law in order to conquer Satan. Jesus could even more say than the psalmist did, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Let me ask you, what do you hide in your life? Um, I, would, I would dare say that you and I have a tendency to hide what is more valuable. You don't hide junk, unless you're my dad. <laughs> you don't hide just meaningless. Folks, folks have safety deposit boxes. I think that's what you call but I don't have one because I don't have much that's valuable. But they have those in, at the bank. And, and, and the idea is that you put very valuable, you hide stuff there to keep it away from someone that may steal it from you. The psalmist said this, the Word of God is so valuable. It's such a premier treasure that I'm going to take it and hide it in my heart so no one can steal it from me. And when I need it, it would be there. It would be there for me. Well, what's the answer to temptation this morning? How does Christ help us in temptation? Three things. Number one, he helps us to understand its tactics. Number two, he helps us to always be on guard against it. Temptation is imminent. Happens, it can happen at any point in time. And then he helps us to learn to rely on the Bible as we make our regular decisions of life. May God help us as we face temptations on a regular basis. Let's stand for prayer.